Welcome to 2020, and welcome to Reitman for the Job, where we talk about Ivan Reitman's friends and colleagues. I neglected someone very important when I was covering Stripes long, long ago. I didn't even mention that was when Joe Medjuk joined up with Ivan Reitman. Here's my problem. I think I'm pretty decent at finding biographies and interviews here and there. Not the best, but I'm decent. And Joe Medjuk isn't a hermit, but everyone only ever asks him about Ghostbusters and not about his career on the whole. He was born in New Brunswick in 1943, went to McGill University in Montreal, and then taught cinema or media studies at Innes College at the University of Toronto. I'm guessing it was in Toronto that he met Ivan Reitman, but I'm not sure. He might even have met Reitman through Dan Goldberg and Len Bloom first, because they were sticking around Toronto for longer while Reitman spent more and more time in the States. See, Joe Medjuk wasn't working with Reitman, Goldberg, and Bloom on orientation, Cannibal Girls, or Meatballs, so he really came into their professional orbit on Stripes as an associate producer. And what does an associate producer do? Why, what doesn't an associate producer do? The things they do, my stars. Ahem, <clears throat> point being, producers sometimes are just titles, but that's definitely not Joe Medjuk. He really is someone who helps get things done. That's really who he is. Someone like Goldberg and Bloom, who is in Ivan Reitman's corner, helping him make things happen. They've been working together ever since, and the Reitmans and Medjucks both live in Montecito, California. That's how close a friendship and professional relationship they have. They're both Canadians who like each other so much that they became neighbors in California. To give you an extra idea, and this is something you know I'll definitely care about, Joe Medjuk and Michael C. Gross, who I'm going to talk about in a minute, Joe Medjuk and Michael C. Gross were the two people Ivan Reitman chose as point men to oversee the real Ghostbusters cartoon series. Ivan didn't have the time or interest to develop a kid's cartoon, but he did care enough and he knew he could trust Medjuk and Gross to look after it. And the Beethoven cartoon. Can't leave out the Beethoven cartoon. Here's a story about Joe Medjuk. You're probably familiar with what happened in the middle of the real Ghostbusters. ABC called in a children's consultant group called Q5. Well, Q5 did focus group work with kids and came to some conclusions, including that kids love Slimer, hate Ray, and that Janine being a cool, feisty woman with fun glasses was scary. Seriously, they are the Boogeyman episode, and these experts think that Janine was scary? Well, anyway, you probably also know that head writer J. Michael Straczynski left the show over the changes they made. What you might not know is that Joe Magic fought hard against these changes, too. In a 2014 interview with BeyondTheMarquee.com, Magic said he got into a big dispute with ABC executives and Q5. Keep in mind, Q5 was just hired by ABC and the network was not obligated to follow their directions at all. ABC could have ditched everything they said, but for some mystifying reason, really mystifying to everyone working on the hit cartoon show, but for some weird reason, ABC really stuck to Q5's recommendations over the proven track record of the show and everyone working on it. So ABC said make these changes or they're not continuing with the series. And Joe Medjuk's first response was, fine, then we're done. He was ready to walk, the same as Straczynski, and keep in mind, Medjuk meant cancelling the entire show. But something changed his mind. See, Deke had a contract to deliver 13 more episodes to ABC, and Medjuk didn't explain exactly what changed his mind, but I'm guessing it would be a hassle and expense for breaking a contract. Plus, remember, this would have seriously put out everyone who had a job on the cartoon. People always forget that. They think, oh, the real Ghostbusters was ruined part of the way through, which is something I don't entirely agree with, but I'll share those thoughts for another day. But people just go, oh, the cartoon changed, and then it sucked. But for me, personally as a fan, I have a lot of respect for Joe Magic, remembering that there were writers and animators who were making a living off that production. So while there's a lot to be said to sticking to your principles, the way Straczynski did, I think fans forget that there was a very real, very human aspect to bending to these stupid demands somewhat. And you know what else? If nothing else, Joe Magic playing hardball with these ABC executives saved Ray on the cartoon. Can you believe it? We almost had a real Ghostbusters cartoon in it without Ray at all. It points to the fact that the experts at Q5 had probably not seen the first movie and had no context for what Ghostbusters even was. So that's Joe Magic, who if you don't know, is a really close friend of Ivan Reitman and definitely his closest business associate. And this is no knock against Len Bloom and Dan Goldberg, but both of those men have spread out doing other projects that don't involve Reitman. Meanwhile, when working on movies and TV shows, Magic is always working for Reitman or the Montecito Picture Company. In all of Ivan Reitman's films I cover going forward, Joe Magic is always there in some producer role. 
But, 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 there is one big facet to Joe Medjuk's life that we haven't even covered yet. Joe Medjuk is one of the founders of the Criterion Collection. You know, the best company that treats film as art and tries to make a wide variety available to the public. Just, Joe Medjuk is already cool for having worked on films we enjoy, but being a founder of Criterion shows that he's just not another suit, but he's someone who cares about film and wants to preserve it. I mean, Criterion was even the first company to release movies on home video with audio commentaries. Criterion was also the first to release films to home video in their original aspect ratio, so if a movie was widescreen, you could get a Laserdisc in widescreen. Nobody ever thought to do that before, and now that's standard. Remember all the times in Ghostbusters on VHS where we didn't see Harold Ramis outside the ballroom? He throws up his fingers to tell Peter how much they should charge? We never saw that on videotape. Now with our fancy widescreen media, we can see that joke again, and Joe Magic is partially responsible? For that matter, and this is crazy, but it's true, he honestly is partially responsible that modern TVs are wider today. Really, it's because he and his partners argued for movies' original aspects even on home screens. The other person we'll talk about today is Michael C. Gross. If you're a Ghostbusters fan, here's the first thing everyone mentions. He designed the No Ghost logo. At least that's the popular story, which we'll get into a moment. That's cool, and I always point out, along with Ray Parker Jr.'s song, that logo is the most publicly recognized element from Ghostbusters. Yes, there's lots of recognizable elements, like Ecto-1, the equipment, Slimer and the Marshmallow Man, but if you're going to talk to a random person about what they know from Ghostbusters, the song and the logo are going to be the first things off the top of their head. But Michael C. Gross did so much more. Born in 1945, north of New York City, Gross was the art director at the National Lampoon magazine almost from the start. Not quite the start, but in the first year. If you remember A Futile and Stupid Gesture, they really dump on the original art directors and frame them as amateurs, while Michael Gross coming in is a professional. <laughs> Actually, Gross was just as blunt in interviews about the previous guys. Instead of making everything look exaggerated like Mad Magazine or tripped out like psychedelic posters and album covers, Gross generally made the magazine look more professional, but with something off. Like in April of 75, it would just be the interior of a passenger plane, but outside the window the ground is upside down, showing the plane is about to crash. I don't want to overstate this because there's definitely a lot of bizarre and goofy things, both on the cover and inside the magazine, but often it would be an image or a page layout that looks kind of normal at first, until you consider it a moment and register what's wrong. But yes, he was the art director from 1970 to 74, and everyone points out he did the If you don't buy this magazine, we'll kill this dog cover from January of 73. It's a perfect moment where the dog's eyes are looking to the side, and there's a human hand holding a gun to the dog's head. Yeah, yeah, it's a pretty shocking, mean joke, but that is its point. By the way, something you might not know about that cover? It was originally conceived by Gross and comedian Ed Bluestone, and the original idea was to make it a running gag. There was going to be a cover or a subscription ad in a later issue with the dog's feet visible, mostly hidden, and there'd be a cat and the text would read something like, You didn't get the message. Buy National Lampoon or the cat gets it. Then there'd be more and more animals. I don't know, I think doing it just the one time is funny enough, and a little less morbid, because you're keeping the joke at the level of a threat, and not going so far as to say that some animals died. That's my thinking anyway. Oh, and another fact about this time. Judith Belushi, John Belushi's wife, assisted Michael Gross in the art department of the magazine. That's neat. She only stopped working with Michael Gross after she transitioned into being a producer on the National Lampoon radio show. Gross left the National Lampoon staff in 74 and started his own design company with partners. But even that's almost a lie. Yes, he and friends struck out on their own and did design work for the likes of John Lennon and Jim Henson. If you watch the first batch of Muppet Babies episodes, the logo at the end that says HA for Henson Associates, that's by Gross. It's still used today for Henson Alternative Productions. But I never digress, right? Never, never. I'm always on story. Oh, my point. So Gross officially left the staff of National Lampoon in 74 and took on lots of freelance work. But then his design firm just became art contractors for National Lampoon for several more years. For a while, he even still had an office with all the National Lampoon people. He wasn't employed by them anymore, but effectively nothing had changed. Oh, oh, a final digression. 
I never knew this before. National Lampoon was in the same building as Marvel Comics. Michael Gross would sometimes go up to the Marvel offices and ask Stan Lee if he could steal an artist for a project. Stan Lee and Michael Gross weren't close, they didn't regularly socialize or anything, but they were friends, and even both ended up in Hollywood years later and would meet by accident and catch up. Speaking of Hollywood, here's how Gross got into the motion picture business. National Lampoon was published by Maddie Simmons. If you remember, Simmons also co-produced Animal House with Ivan Reitman. Well, Maddie Simmons had a business partner, Leonard Mogul. Leonard Mogul was publishing the American version of the Heavy Metal magazine. I'll be covering that story in more detail in Heavy Metal Zone episode. But yes, if you never realized the connection how Ivan Reitman ended up producing the Heavy Metal film, it's because Reitman co-produced Animal House, and now Leonard Mogul was hoping to repeat the same success of Animal House with a Heavy Metal movie. Again, I'll lay that out even more clearly soon. But Len Mogul has the Heavy Metal magazine and wants it to be a movie. He talks about it around the office. Michael Gross, the artist and designer, is there and tells Mogul, oh, he knows a lot about animation. I love it. In an interview Gross gave to the Comics Journal in 2015, he says that he was just straight up lying. He believed he could figure it all out, and hey, he mostly did. So Mogul had Gross on as an associate producer, which doesn't really explain what Gross actually did. Gross was basically the producer making sure the art and animation worked. That all the studios had everything that they needed. The next thing Mogul did was call Ivan Reitman to be the main producer, and then Heavy Metal was on its way. And so was Gross's career in the film industry. Sticking with National Lampoon, he designed things for the Vacation film in 1983, directed by Harold Ramis. He designed what that dumb car looks like, which is fun. Just remember it, wood paneling on the outside where there's no reason for wood paneling. He designed elements of Wally World and the mascot, Marty Moose. And then there was Ghostbusters, which required a lot of art, so much that Gross was overseeing a team of artists. And we'll dig into just some of that when we cover Ghostbusters. So artists were designing terror dogs and ghosts, proton packs and ectomobiles, and this all had to be done in a year, by the way. This was incredibly fast on a big production. And we often boil this down to one touchstone, that Michael Gross created the No Ghost logo. Okay, okay, but there's something that's often overlooked. Artist Brent Boats, that's B-O-A-T-E-S, Boats, really created it with Gross. Frankly, Gross actually directed Brent Boats on what to draw, and Boats sketched out some examples. This could be a tricky thing on who deserves more credit and all that. And I mean, the logo was pretty much described even in earlier scripts. So you could argue Dan Aykroyd and maybe Harold Ramis deserve partial credit as well. But really, I think the best way to explain things is that Michael Gross and Brent Boats both created the No Ghost logo. Or Moogly for all you hardcore Ghostbusters fans. I contacted Brent Boats to ask him a few questions on co-creating the logo and working with Michael Gross, but he did not get back to me. His first movie was working under Gross on Heavy Metal, and he continues to have a really great career, primarily as a storyboard artist. Brent Boats storyboarded Men in Black, some of the X-Men movies, Captain America, The First Avenger, lots and lots of cool stuff. Oh, oh, about the logo. In the 2009 Time Life set of the real Ghostbusters, Gross even explained why the logo was flipped. I mean, flipped at least in North America. And the red stripe goes from the bottom left to the top right. That's not how the international no signs work, right? Go look at a no smoking sign. The stripe goes from the top left to the bottom right. So what happened? Gross says he did mock-ups with the word Ghostbusters in that stripe, but it never looked right on the regular logo. The letters were descending and for some reason that made it more difficult for people to read it immediately. So he just flipped the logo. So the letters are ascending and he found people had an easier time reading Ghostbusters in that stripe. So there's the reason. Of course, the big irony is that very few promotional images or products ended up having the title in the stripe anyway. I think the old phone you could get in the shape of the logo is the main thing I can think of. Then the kicker. Gross says other markets insisted on using the correct logo. That's how the UK, Europe, Japan, and other markets got the more proper, non-flipped logo. I must admit I prefer the flipped, the North American version, but I don't know if that's just because I'm used to it. Tying things together with Joe Medjuk again, Michael Gross was really indispensable to the productions of Heavy Metal and Ghostbusters, since both required so much design work and art. Gross was another rock that Reitman could rely on, so he was bumped up to executive producer on Ivan Reitman's films moving forward. 
1986, when the real Ghostbusters was going to happen, Gross and Medjuk were the natural choices to oversee it, make sure it came out on brand, and, you know, of as high a quality as the budget could allow. Gross especially was a good choice, given his background in art, and since heavy metal, working with animation studios. And ditto all again when Beethoven the Dog was turned into a cartoon in 1994. Michael Gross retired in 1995 and lived in Italy for a time, and got back into creating art, particularly painting. He came back to Los Angeles and even mentioned that the industry had changed and really moved on without him, so I'm not sure if he would have liked to get back into producing movies or not. He passed away in 2015 and had children and grandchildren. One of his sons, Dylan Gross, started out as an assistant camera operator on Ghostbusters 2 and Kindergarten Cup. Dylan Gross has gone on to specialize in aerial photography in movies, including Titanic, Grindhouse, Guardians of the Galaxy 2, and Spider-Man Homecoming. If you need footage from a helicopter or an airplane in your movie, Dylan Gross is one of the top people in the industry. Oh, and finally, where you can see both men in the movie Ghostbusters. During the montage scene with the song playing, you see the back of Larry King. In comes Time magazine, and in the very top right corner, you can see Michael Gross poking his head out. Yeah, <laughs> that's neat. Joe Medjuk has two cameos. One is right near the start of the movie, even before the title. When we first see the main floor of the New York Public Library, Medjuk walks by in the foreground. He's wearing glasses and has a beard. You see him again during the montage, after the Omni magazine goes by. Egon exits a building with a ghost trap, and Medjuk is walking by and looks at him. Hey, impress your friends. Point out these cameos the next time you watch Ghostbusters with people. They'll be very impressed and not at all annoyed with you for talking during the movie. That is the late Michael C. Gross, and Joe Medjuk continues to produce with Ivan Reitman to this day, including Ghostbusters 2016 and the upcoming Afterlife movie. Again, we really focus on the actors a director works with, but if you're talking about teams that really make movies happen, Joe Medjuk and Michael C. Gross have done more with Ivan Reitman than anyone else, even any of the actors that we're familiar with. Thanks for listening. I'm Ross May, and you can say hi to me on Twitter, at Ross May Writer, or go to rossmaywriter.com and find my email there. I'll talk to you later, but for now, we'd better split up. I need to go walk this comically big dog. You'll howl in delight with the biggest, most lovable dog the world has ever known. Good old George. Beethoven's animated video cassette collection from MCA Universal Home Video. Beethoven!